Hey, let's bring in our next guest on FT Live, coming from the Kansas City Royals, Bobby Witt Jr. joining us right now. Bobby, good to see you, man. How you been? Good. How are you guys doing? Thanks for really having me. Really good. Really good. Facial hair is tight. I like it, dude. Great, great uh, to see you for the second half of the season here. And let's bring our combo right into what you think so far of what you've seen from Ellie De La Cruz. And can you help us run through what he's going through as a rookie trying to take the league by storm? You went through all of this with life coming at you fast a year ago. Yeah, it's we got to see him firsthand. I think it was about a couple of weeks ago, and it was impressive just to see kind of what he's done. But, yeah, you know, like I kind of was hearing y'all talk about it. He didn't have a hit last series or whatever, but it's just part of the game. You guys know. And so I think that – Sometimes I feel like as a young guy coming up, you got to kind of almost put the weight of the team on your shoulders. And I feel like I've done that in the past. And just with coming up, I'm supposed to be this franchise guy or whatever with the Royals and this. And you just put so much pressure on yourself whenever you got to still be relying on the other eight guys. You got to just all be pulling on the same strings, all be doing doing your job to help the team win. And I think that that's, that's the biggest thing that for me and I guess for him, it's like everyone just kind of buys in. I think that's whenever baseball just kind of takes off. I know you've said in the past that you don't always get super nervous at those moments like big league debut and going through things. So what advice would you have for someone like Ellie De La Cruz when you feel like you have all of Cincinnati on your shoulders as such a young player? And also, when are you going to steal home like that? <laughs> I've been working on that, trying to time, time some things up. So hopefully <laughs> soon, I don't know whenever the time's right. But yeah, I just think it's just, you just got to go out there and just remember this is the game you've been playing ever since you were however old and just maybe a little bit bigger stage, more fans coming to watch you, uh, bigger stadium, whatever, facing big leaguers, but just know whenever it comes down to it, just try to be a little leaguer in there. He's doing what little league guys do in big league games. So it's, I think that's the biggest thing. Just go out there and just let your talent show, prepare the right way, get your body, get your mind right, and then go out there and just perform. Speaking of what little league guys do in big league games, uh, my my little peanut Drew Waters, absolutely pimping a four hundred sixty five. Oh. Yeah, uh, a little bat flip on his second home run of the year. We're talking about little big leagues. What advice can you give to someone like that who you see as all the talent in the world? He's not a face of the franchise like a David Cruz guy, but you know the talent's there, and you want to get the most out of him, and you just want to get him to relax. So, how have you guys, kind of both young guys coming up, how have you helped him to kind of develop a routine? Where do yeah, you go with I think, I think it's kind of almost our whole team besides Salvi and a couple yeah. other guys that we got a bunch of young guys. But, yeah, just with Drew and other guys, it's just, yeah, like you said, just finding that routine before the game, getting your mind right, getting prepared. I think that's the biggest thing as a young player is just knowing because if your prep work is almost harder than the game is, the game just kind of – you just play the game and just taking it bit by piece, piece by piece, just kind of inning by inning and then not really let those failure moments kind of take over. And I think that's the biggest thing for – for us as a team, don't let, yeah, we're in last place, but also just try to learn, learn from, take some wins out of the games, take what went, what went well, even though we lost and just try to build off that and just kind of keep moving forward and just try to limit those failures and know that the failure is going to happen. I think that's the only way you can learn in this game is by, by failure. And so that's what kind of everyone's kind of starting to buy in and just hopefully just kind of start piling up some wins and getting those things going. But yeah, I'd say that's the biggest thing. Just getting that good routine uh, as a young player. And so you can stick with that and just make minor adjustments to that and just try to make the game as easy as possible after that. Bobby. Sorry. Uh-oh. Who's, call, who, who's calling? Oh, that's my – it's actually my girlfriend's iPad. That's on oh. her. We're good now. Are we FaceTiming, <laughs> are we FaceTiming somebody or no. what? It was – she left her iPad here, and so I don't know what it is. Ooh, don't look uh -oh. at it. Yeah, now answer. you're getting all her calls for the day. <laughs> don't, don't answer. <laughs> Turned it off. <laughs> you were talking about how you guys are in Kansas City, obviously in last place. You won. I'm guessing you you won a lot in the minor leagues. You won in high school, right? You probably won in Little League. How do you deal and, – and I know the routine is important, but how do you deal with it? Because I was – I came up with the Twins, and we were not very good, and we lost a lot of games. So how do you deal with it as a young guy and say, man, I'm going to make this better and not succumb to – Oh, it's okay. We're losing again today. What, what's your plan for that? Yeah, it's it's definitely frustrating um, as a young guy. I'm just losing in general. I think I like I hate losing more than I like winning. And so it's just whenever you start piling up those losses, it's just kind of how how can you deal with it? And I think the biggest thing is just kind of 
going over what went, went wrong after the game, just kind of talking in the clubhouse, whatever it is, and just kind of just figuring those things out. And like I said earlier, just taking those little wins that you have, whether it's you get a base hit, just kind of build off that, or you make a good play, you just help help the team in any any way possible and just kind of build off those little things and then just really just learn through that that those those tough times because it kind of some some of those things stick with you and you like you make a mistake all right whatever and then next next game the same thing happens and then you learn from that so you just try to make those quick adjustments and I think it's just just learning uh is the biggest thing I don't know really how else to explain it just trying to no. to limit limit that failure and just limit those mistakes and just make adjustments because this is what this game is how quick can you make the adjustments and how big can they help you who do you go for to talk about those things do you go to salvi do you go to q your manager do you go to your dad your dad played in the big leagues right so you're very lucky you can pick up the phone and say hey dad i made an error tonight at shortstop and i also struck out what do you got for me and you can say well tomorrow you're going to get four hits and steal four bases so it's okay i did this kid like that's got to be a luxury that most people don't have so who do you go for yeah, it's a little bit of everyone, uh, whether it's talking with Salvi or veterans on the team and just seeing, like, what what did you guys go through in 2013 uh, whenever y'all were kind of start to make that rebuild? And then what, what was that What was that thing that kind of flipped the switch for from 2013 to 2014, making the postseason run, making it to the World Series, and then 2015 winning the World Series? And then I can go to my dad where he I pretty much call him after every game. We go through the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever it is, and just kind of just go through the game because we – Wherever we are, we're always talking baseball, and that's just kind of how kind of I was raised and how my family is. Even with having three older sisters, they're always talking baseball. They all married three baseball players, so our whole family's pretty much baseball. And so, uh, yeah, just talking with him, just kind of because he went through it with some teams and stuff, and he's won a World Series with the Diamondbacks 2001, just at, talking with my dad about what what was that team camaraderie like? What was it like in the clubhouse? What was it like that? And even talking with Q and just – talking to him about because this is his first time managing too and he's just he's coming to us asking us questions which is great just for what give it given our feedback telling him what do we think needs to change and asking a guy like me that and that has a little over a year in the big leagues it's pretty it's pretty cool just to just to have and have that and then through just kind of mental performance side is another huge thing um work with the guy brian kane he's been great i've had him throughout high school and um now just kind of just a guy, another guy just to talk to, just that mental side of the game, because that's, I think it's so, so big and so huge in this game. Well, first and foremost, say hi to your dad for me, because it seems like a lifetime ago, your dad was actually my agent. Yes, uh, yes, for, for sure, I remember. Um, and then, but I wanted to touch on with Q, because he was my hitting coach for a while in Cleveland, and one of my favorite coaches I've ever been around. How has his adjustment seems, and how are you guys working together kind of along this process of getting in new positions yeah and like i guess uh, you know how how he is it just kind of laid back real real cool just kind of like that that player's coach so he's in there just really just kind of he's i think kind of learning through through it all too as well going through the the tough times and with this and because he's been been to with the, the rays going to the world series and everything and so it just kind of i think it's just learning how to because we're all so young we're all so different in the clubhouse and so it's just really just trying to find find where where our our roles are pretty much and he's trying to help us i feel like find what our roles are as a big leader and just telling us just to kind of go out there play learn yourself and do your job and that's kind of what he's been and he's just kind of like that if you need to go talk to him go in and talk to him the door is always open and so which is great to have oh, wait i need to know more about um bobby witt oh. senior uh representing jason kipnis kip can we bring you back in here dude uh can you give us a little more on that so did he swing any deals for you? Any like little side marketing contracts? Any good comments? Honestly, did Bobby Jr. come along and say, what's good? No, it was, it, I mean, it was so long ago. I'm trying to remember even why he isn't my agent still to this day or something like that has <laughs> happened. I think I was with a certain company and they're like, I was leaving them and they're like, before you leave, we want you to be with him. And I, I the, your dad was awesome. Uh, and I, I respected the hell out of him. I just think, I honestly, it's been so many years. I'm trying to really think of why we parted ways, but uh, he didn't get you that four hundred million dollar deal. That's why you're like, <laughs> hey, I can get an. If, if if there's an agent who could have got me a four hundred million dollar deal, they need to be on a Mount Rushmore somewhere. Then, <laughs> <laughs> Bobby, is he representing you, or do you have separate rep? Yes, yeah, he represents me. Him and another guy, kind of just 
So it's been it's been great. It's been pretty easy. Well, You'd like to think he has your best interests at heart. Yeah. I yeah. Yes. What yeah. is your dad? Yeah. So like the, <laughs> nego- the negotiation part's kind of hard for him because it's almost like he's always dad first in, a, in those ways. So, but yeah. How are you taking care of him? Are you paying him like on a contract or are you just going <laughs> to, here's a, here's a watch or here's a car later on from the deal you got me? Yeah, just I think it's all kind of just all whatever the, the business side of it is. But yeah, I got him a car back after I signed, so that was kind of a little thank you. Good for man, good man. Everything. And so we try to pick up the tab at dinners every once in a while. Nice. That's all a right. baller move. Oh, hey yeah. dad, here's a car. No, what I'm thinking yeah. is when he signs like for a hundred million, like a big long term extension, you know, he'd be like, Dad, here's a Rolex, dude. Thanks. You're my dad, beat it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> <right here. laughs> you don't get you don't get the percent you're supposed to get. You're just gonna hear I'm gonna buy you a I'm going to buy you a Timex. Here you go, Dad. Thanks. I love you, yeah. but uh, we're moving on. Yeah, he'd like that. <laughs> hey, Bobby, I know um, you're a big card guy. We'll do segments on here um, where we'll rip packs. Oh, we don't have it today because we're in separate spots. But let's run through your love for cards, what you're working on business-wise on that front. I mean, give me it all from – I think you've got a separate social account you're running. I know you've got the deal I've seen with PSA, which grades cards – um, so tell us about that. And then also, I think this was last year. I spoke to Vinny Pasquantino and he said that you guys were trying to swing some deals and, and he wasn't that like, um, educated on it. So I think he might've held back because he was worried that he was going to get taken. So yeah, give me the whole scope. Yeah. So I started collecting cards ever since I was little. And then throughout high school and stuff, I kind of stopped just because baseball kind of got real and, uh, was focusing on that. But then going back over COVID, I was going through some of my cards and like looking up on eBay, like what they're worth and everything. And I had a couple of Mike Trout rookies and I was like, dang, they're <coughs> worth a couple, couple of grand. And so I'm like, I'm going to get these things graded, see how it comes back. And then just going through the collection and just how much the card like hobby just broke out during COVID was crazy. And didn't just send in cards out to PSA, getting them graded, doing that. And then just like, kind of like going on eBay, bidding on cards bidding against people it's just it's just fun it's just kind of great great fun and then just seeing how valuable like my own cards are and stuff like that so starting to collect my own cards and this year i've been well i've heard from mike trout last year he was buying kind of boxes every time he hit a home run and so now i was like all right and said that i'm just gonna buy one of my own cards every time i hit a home run so i've kind of been doing that this year which has been fun just kind of going on ebay buying my own cards bidding against people i got an alias on there so people don't know i'm kind of bidding on my myself on there but uh so yeah that's been that's been fun and the thing with Vinny was i think i got some uh pulled like a zach wilson autograph rookie card and at the time it was like worth a couple hundred bucks and i was like Vinny, i'll give it to you for 200 bucs or whatever he's like i don't know how this guy but now that card's probably worth 25 50 bucks so he, he made he made the right choice on that <laughs> he yeah. turned you down hey so you have a burner basically right because obviously like you said i mean you can't be like hey guys bobby witt jr here trying to buy my own cards everyone's gonna be like oh man they're double right now so do you like comment and all that and are there conversations that you have or you have to kind of like keep it cool yeah just with ebay it's pretty easy just they don't really you just send the offer and if they accept it then you get the card if not then you kind of negotiate a little bit i never really kind of comment on the stuff it just kind of gets shipped home so yeah. And then on the trout part, I like that. So when you hit a homer, you get yourself a box, take care of yourself. Did trout talk to you about this? Is this something you learned from when you were with them at team USA for world baseball classic? Yeah. So a little bit there and we kind of talked back and forth when he came into town last year, he texted me and asked where's like a good local card shop uh, to buy cards out in Kansas city. Cause I think one of the, either the clubbies or one of their guys, I think one of the, uh, Ali Madami, one of the BP throwers, uh, he, he kind of gets the cards. He's big into cards too. And so uh, I got, to, he was with us with USA too, him and then Trout. And so we were kind of talking a little bit about that. And he was just telling me how, how much and stuff he was spending on cards. And so it, it was crazy, but he's buying the nice couple thousand dollar boxes and pulling some crazy cards. So his collection has got to be worth, I don't even know, a crazy amount, but yeah, it's pretty cool just to see guys like him collecting cards. And then you see other guys around the league doing it. So I turned around and I said exactly what we're talking about. I just found a couple uniform pieces of my own that I did the same exact process. Uh, what I'm wondering, and sometimes when people like, if you get them in the mail or something, you're like, wow, I've never seen this before. I'm not sending it back. Can I trade you some? I'd rather send you a bat or a, like anything because so I can keep this card. I want to know if tops or why players haven't asked this. Does tops or anything like if you ask for a copy of every one of your cards, 
would they send that to you? I I don't know. I've never asked. I know whenever I was doing my first like Bowman Chrome signing and stuff, they offered like an, an amount. I don't know how much it was. I can't really re- remember what it was for if I wanted to keep my uh, one of one uh, yeah. gold refractor of it. And I was like, ah, I don't know what it was that they offered, like 5000 little, maybe a little less, just taken out of like whatever I'm signing for it. And I was like, ah, no, nah, that's a lot of money. And then next thing I know, I think it's like two, three months later, I see the card sold for like close to 50 grand. So I was like, dang, that's oh. that one I miss out on that. So then that's that that one, that, at that moment, I was like, dang, this is this is serious, this card collection, and then getting on that whatnot, watching people rip packs. I was like, dang, I'm never going to do that. And then here I am in bed. That's what I kind of spend my free time on, just kind of watching that, just just a fun hobby. Yeah, I was the one that bought your one-on-one as an alien. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here. Make that's crazy, though. <laughs> no, Kip, I don't think – I mean, and that's cool that they offered that, but, like, if you go through all of the cards, I mean, like he's saying, like some of those Bowman one-on-ones, like they're – worth a lot i I think if they tried to offer them to all the players it would be uh it would be hefty and you want some of the fans to be able to pull those no at least for some of these cases i'm not i'm not talking about like a one of one but i know like guys like sounds like bobby and me like you grew up as fans you collected cards when you were younger and you it's 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 weird to describe but it's so cool to have your own card and i don't think players really talk about it that much so i'm just saying not even one of one but like if they're printing off thousands, send me one of each one. It doesn't have to be a one of one, just one of 5,000 or something. So I can like, if you frame all the cards of yourself together, it's a cool memento I think to have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just got my iPads actually set up on a box of cards. Cause I got to sign them now. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah just, I don't miss that. Tons of them. My, my thing is, is, is yeah. If they gave away the one of ones, there would be one of two. So there'd be two copies of the card. So Bobby, you could say, yeah, look, I got this $50,000 card. Yours isn't worth shit now. So here, here's the other one. No, so they're what, talking about the one of one. I, that's like, what I'm were, saying. But if but if Bobby said, I want the one of one, they would print another one. And Bobby would say, well, I'll never yeah. sell it. And then 10 years later, he'd be like, hey, I have the other one. Who <laughs> wants it, right? When he After he makes the all-star team a couple times and does all this great stuff. But I want to go back to what you said. Mike Trout is in Kansas City. He walks into a card shop. What's the reaction from the owner of the card shop? Is he stopping? <laughs> is like, that's, that's holy right. I, I don't shit, think Mike Trout him. just walked in. I don't think it was him. I think he had guys going into the the store for him, getting the cards, bringing it back, and then them opening them either in the clubhouse or in his hotel room or whatever. Yeah, okay. I don't think he can go in there. I was going to say, like, can, I'm, can I'm, you imagine I'm, the owner? The owner of the shop walks. He's just sitting there. He's looking down. The bell rings on the door, and he's like, oh, my God, Mike Trout. Just, what do you want? What can I we sign? Oh, d- d-. Yeah. Right? And then Mike Trout's like, I'll take the $40,000 card box up there. I'll take that, and I'll take this. And he walks out with business. like – yeah, he just talks out with a grocery bag full of cards and just walking down the street in Kansas City. Oh, I'm no big oh, yeah. deal. That'd be pretty awesome if you're the card shop owner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No doubt. Hey, uh, Bobby, we've got some questions from fans. So a few of them asking about your spot in the lineup, and you've been hitting really well. Do you have a favorite spot? Is the two-hole your thing right now? Yeah, I like anywhere in a, a lineup's good. But I was leading off early in the year, and – I'm kind of an aggressive hitter, so it's almost like the night before I'm going to sleep, I'm like, all right, am I going to swing at that first pitch? Am I not going to swing at the first pitch? And it's just kind of like just just dumb stuff I was doing. But then, yeah, just I, I like the two-hole, whatever. And But, yeah, just lead off. I don't know if it was just I, – I didn't mind it. I didn't mind it. It's just you lead off pretty much once a game, really. But, you know, whenever that lineup's turned over, you kind of got to spark something or do something. But, yeah, so a two-hole has been great, yeah. Six extra six hit, six games in a row with an extra base hit. Let's go. Let's get the record. Isn't that a ro- tied for Royals record? So let's go tonight. You, let's get seven. Oh, and, and when yeah. you get on there, you know, give let's me give us some celebration. Sweet. Yeah. Well, save those legs a little. I picked you to lead the league in stolen bases. So let's let's maybe a couple singles I mix in there. Work. That's yeah. how you get to second and third. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I need to get that. Right, wait, I want to ask you this then. As a as a base dealer from coming up through the minors and the way you've always played, how much are you noticing the difference in rules where they can't pick over or the, the clock? Uh, have you gotten that down to the advantages that it's created for the runners? Yeah, I think it's starting to, I'm starting to kind of like figure that out a little bit more, just going through and just looking at tendencies and everything and just uh, of what the pitcher does and picks off and stuff. But you can definitely tell, like even when I'm hitting, you could see like the pitcher kind of come set 
whenever a runner's on and kind of like you could see his eyes going left to right, looking at that pitch clock and trying to time it out. And I think as a base runner, if you know that that's a pitcher that's doing that, he's waiting until to get to one, right? When he gets to one, just take off or, yep. or if they're kind of one of those guys that just like to get the ball, go quick and just, then you can just kind of take off right away. But definitely I think that the pressure is more now on the pitcher with the runners, whenever runners get on base, I don't know what the stat is, but it would be cool just to kind of see what like pitchers t- statistics are now with runner with base dealers on first. And just, if there's a difference in whether it's strike percentages or whatever it is, I think that'd be kind of cool just to see. Bobby, Although, when you saw that come out on the stolen base front, that clearly when the rules were announced that, that it became official in the off season, did you give me, did you do one of these? Like, okay, let's go. And maybe you didn't expect 40 plus percent stolen bases to go up in all of major league baseball, but clearly you knew like it's on. Yeah. I think too, is just also another thing for guys just to have, I think guys would always able be able to steal these bases like this, but now it's just like one of those things where it's like, like how the first guy who ran a three minute mile, no one did it. And then once he did it, thousands of people did it. And so it's like one of those things, Oh, we got bigger bases. Why not? Now we got a little edge to steal more bases, but really I feel like it's always, it's always been there. It's always been, I think the game was kind of going away from it, but now it was just that little pitch clock, a little bit bigger bases, only a couple pickoffs. And now guys are like, all right, now we can, see how this works and then guys are seeing it oh wow guys are actually stealing more bases and then it's like oh i want to do that and then everyone's doing it now so yeah i think that yeah i think it helps but also it's almost like one of those things oh look now we can do more i want to take you back to world baseball classic for one more question so how much cooler are you now that you played on that team like what kind of do you have everyone's phone numbers now are you like off season oh hey you know, Mookie, I'm in town. Oh, hey, Trouty, let's go, like, rip some packs, all that. You know, who are some yeah, of the dudes that you made close friends with? Pretty much all those guys in that clubhouse. It was it was like I was kind of like – I felt like I was just going to be the fly on the wall during that just because I knew what my role was really. But then I was pretty much just, like, in every conversation just talking. And then that group chat we had was probably one of the coolest things. I I'm just like, we got every dude – every star dude in this group chat. And then look, another cool thing, I'm walking in the cage and it's like Trout, Mookie, King Griffey Jr. Are all having a conversation. I'm like, all right, I'm just going to walk in here and see what's going on. Just <laughs> check this out. So yeah, just that experience was unbelievable. And then just playing in it and doing that was, was great. And then being able to almost like I was, I was on first. So I came in a pinch run the pit or whenever Mookie was hitting, Otani was pitching. So I was like, wow, this is, like I, I felt like I was just floating at that time. It was, it was awesome just being able to kind of get out there. And then I was so, uh, right after Mookie got out, I came back in the dugout and I was sitting like right at the top step watching that Trout versus Otani. It felt like it didn't feel real, like just sitting there watching that and then just being in there with those guys in the clubhouse and just learning so much just from each and every one of them. And it's like, you would think that all these guys, all their all all stars, they all they got it done. They got millions of dollars. I think our lineup was worth over a billion dollars or whatever it was. And so just like you're like, all right, these guys got it done and then you look and see their work ethic. Oh, now you know why that these are guys are all stars every year. These guys are MVPs because just the work they put in, the preparation they put in, it was second to none. It was, so it was really, really an honor just to be a part of that, be around those guys and then the group of the coaching staff we had was unbelievable. Michael Young, D. Rowe, Griffey, Andy Pettit, Brian McCann. It was just, it was just awesome. I'm glad you took advantage of that because one of my biggest regrets, uh, I pushed out. It was my rookie year. I got, we were playing the Yankees at home. Our visiting clubhouse and batting cages were closed down, so the Yankees had to use ours. Talk to Jeter at second base and had some questions for him, and he's like, "Come meet me uh, in the cages tomorrow or something," because so I could follow up with him. I think I opened the door and it was just Jeter, A-Rod, and Cano hitting. And then immediately I was just like, nope. <laughs> Close the door immediately. So I'm glad you at least took advantage and soaked it in, all that stuff. Because I, I, one of my biggest regrets was being intimidated by interactions with them. And you start thinking of these guys as peers and start playing against them. And that's the right way to do it. So I'm happy you got to experience that. I think it's only going to be beneficial for you. Uh, and we really do wish you the best of luck in your career. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it was awesome. Wait, quick follow here. So when when you entered that room, is it one of those, like, do you do it smooth? Or is it one of those, like, hey, guys, what are we talking about? Or is it <laughs> just like, oh, strolling in, my, my turn to, to hit the cages. Oh, go ahead, guys, you can go. I'll, I'll just Wait, kick I, back. I'm reading AJ's face. He's so being like, 
who the hell cares, but it was, no. it, was, it was a rookie and I just opened the door and I just I was like, nope, no, no, I was, I, I was surprised because when I, when A-Rod was at the Yankees and we tried to go in the cage, he kicked us out because he didn't want anyone seeing his routine. I'm like, what? You're hitting off a tee. No other big leaguer hits off a tee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, come on, dude. You're not that cool. He's got I mean, a unless, patent on it, AJ. Well, I was going to say, unless he's yeah. doing something he shouldn't have been, which <laughs> he might have. <laughs> there he is. Wait, is the group chat still running, Bobby? That that USA group chat, or is it quieted down a little with the season? Yeah, there was like a couple texts after opening day, and this there's some little things, and but nothing nothing recently. So bring it back. Let's yeah, go. dude. Bring I mean, it maybe back. not in the season, but in the off season, just like right day after World Series, you could just be like, you got to send like some gift or whatever. Is it? I I kept hearing back then like Kyle Tucker was like sneaky funny in there and would oh send yeah he was he shit. was ru- yeah he was running the um, the speaker in the the clubhouse too so we got the good vibes going in there and yeah there was some there was some funny gifts memes whatever you want to call them in that yep. group chat okay so maybe especially after going. especially after Trey hit that homer oh there's yeah some, there's some good yes stuff. all right so maybe they're too competitive during the season I feel like. I mean, plus they're busy, but right. Like, uh, we're not, you know, we're friends, but we're not going to be texting all day, but maybe it fires up again in the off season. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I think so. But it was, it was really cool. Just the, the pitchers and the hitters, how like they got close, but then they also didn't get close. Cause you know that you weren't going to face any of those guys. Yeah. And I hey, think I'm, friends. I'm over. Yeah. I think I'm over like 26 against the USA pitchers. Cause I was hanging around them too much. So I gotta, <laughs> I gotta change that out. <laughs> Yeah, they're friends, Scott, but they're not that kind of friends. See, when you're a player and you have group text, Kip, Bob, you understand. Scott doesn't understand. But you have text and you're friends. Until then, you're not friends anymore. You're friends, but you're not friends like that. It's called frenemies. Yeah, yeah you, you can text each other, but then you got to face them. And like you said, he's over 26 off of uh, – off the USA pitcher. So he's like, we're friends, but we're not really friends. Because yeah. if they were friends, you just lay one in there and let me get at least one. No doubt. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bobby, awesome to have you on, dude. Really appreciate the time. Good chat. Um, keep doing your thing here in the second half, man. We'll catch you again soon. Yes, sir. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Bobby Witt Jr. from the Kansas City Royals. You too, man. Have a good one. Um, good stuff there.